Test, test. Well, good morning. Hope everybody's doing good this morning. I want to welcome you and thank you so much for joining us today at Community Life Church on this beautiful and chilly Sunday morning. Good morning to all those that are logging in online. I hear Jackie Bell searching for her. She's in Italy right now, so um, she's logging in to make sure that Jim goes to work today. That's what she's doing. Um, a couple quick announcements before I get you up on your feet and, and have you welcoming folks. Uh, we have about 70-ish families that we're supporting um, throughout the, the Christmas holidays, 70 families who have a family member that is deployed. And so we're trying to do something special for them this year. We are going to send them a care package with some cool stuff from Christmas and ways for them to be able to connect to the holiday season. And so inside your bulletin is this really neat little flyer. If you pull that out, there's just some ideas of things that maybe you can go purchase and bring back. And we're going to stuff all those boxes and, and send them out before we get too close to the holiday so we can make sure that they get to them um, while they're out. We're also recording messages and they'll have ways to link in while they're in the field. And so just thinking about them and praying for them and really just want them to have a way to connect back to home. And so, so consider that if that's something that speaks to your heart. Also, Night to Shine is right around the corner. And so for those of you who don't know what Night to Shine is, that is our special needs prom. It's probably the coolest event in the entire community for the entire year. And so we need a lot of folks to be able to jump in to help out with that. On the way out today, there's a pallet wall on the left-hand side, and it has a list of different options of ways to volunteer. Stop by, pick out one of those cards, and find out a way that you can connect. And um, we're just excited about, once again, gearing back up and, and really participating in that event, looking forward to what God has in store for us. Are you guys ready for a great Sunday? Yeah. All right, so why don't we jump up on our feet, welcome someone around you. Uh, so good to see you all this morning. It's a mama singing songs about the Lord. It's a daddy spending family time the world says he cannot afford. These simple moments change the world. It's a pastor at a tiny little church. Forty years of loving on the broken and the hurt. These simple moments change the world. Dream small, don't buy the lie, you've got to do it all. Just let Jesus use you where you are, one day at a time. Live well, loving God and others as yourself. Find little ways where only you can help. With his great love, a tiny rock can make a giant fall. All right, so um, we'll start the service by praying the Lord's Prayer together. And then after that, I'm just going to go into a prayer of blessing over um, all of these bags. Uh, you guys are helping to support 100, it was 98 families. That's about 400 people we're going to offer Thanksgiving dinners to. And then there was enough food left over. We're going to do that for Christmas too. So I'll give yourselves a big round of applause. I think that's awesome. And uh, just excited about this. So why don't we start by praying the Lord's Prayer together? Let's do that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a beautiful morning, God, and for all of the hearts and lives that are here today. God, and as we take and as we apply ourselves to your word and to the teaching of your word, I just pray that you would open us up and allow us to experience life maybe in a different way today, something that challenges us and causes us to grow and, and just experience the beauty of, of the creator, of the ultimate one who loves us with, with more than we could ever possibly imagine. And so, God, we, we thank you for this morning. Um, we think about all of these bags up front, God, each of which represents a family. And right now, we just take time to pray a blessing over all of these families, 400-ish folks that will be able to gather around a table and enjoy Thanksgiving dinner. And we just pray right now for those conversations, that in those moments, God, they would experience great memories that they'll remember for a long time. God, and I just pray that your blessing would just resonate through the family, maybe the conversation about where the food came from. But even if not that, how about the blessings that we have of living in a country, God, that, that allows us and affords us the opportunity to give and to receive and to worship in a way that, God, we feel is, is near and dear to our heart. And so, God, we just thank you for this opportunity today. We love you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Happy Thanksgiving week, y'all. You can remain standing. I'm going to do a beautiful song, Chris Tomlin called Our God. The words should be on the screen for you. Y'all feel free to join him. Water you turned into wine. You opened the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you Into the darkness you shine Hell out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, our God is free. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God. Our God And if our God is for us Then who could ever stop us And if our God is with us Then what could stand against And if our God is for us Then who could ever stop us and if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Yeah, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, our God is greater. Our God is higher. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. be seated. Y'all sounding good out there today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this beautiful Sunday, cool, crisp Sunday morning. Today's a day of Thanksgiving, and as Scott said, we give a blessing over all these families that's less fortunate. It's going to be saying thanks to you for a good meal on Thanksgiving. Father, we thank you for each and every one that's here with us this morning and the ones that's viewing us on live stream. And we are so thankful that you're a God that we can come to any time or place, any day or night. Thank you for your tender mercies upon us, Lord. And we ask your blessings on all the one that's uh, less fortunate, that might not can be with us today. And the ones that, that has unspoken needs, Lord, you know them right where they're at. We ask your blessings on the worship team this morning as they deliver your word and song. Ask your blessing on Jim as he delivers our Bible study. And, of course, God, as he delivers our continuous series. And as we transition into this time of giving, Lord, we ask that each one can give us their heart feels led, for you know their needs. And we'll ask all this in your name. Amen. Here's a little Thanksgiving song that I wrote called, I Just Want to Thank You, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. All the blessings in my life I just want to thank you, Lord For my children and my wife For the birds that sing For the love you bring For the sun that shines And you in my life Thank you Thank you, Lord 
I just want to thank you, Lord, for my mom and my dad. I just want to thank you, Lord, for all the love we had. For the moon at night, for the stars so bright, for giving me sight, and you in my life. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. My family, my friends, a love with no end. My job, my home. And never be it alone With you, I'm never alone Thank you Thank you, Lord I just want to thank you Thank you, Lord Good morning. No shorts. This weather is schizophrenic. I think yesterday, like I put the heater on, then I opened the doors, and I put the air conditioner on, and I put open the doors, and I put the heater on, and I opened the doors. I can't figure out what's going on. I want to welcome you today. We have been in the book of Hebrews, and we're going to be in there for a while yet, but. Hebrews is the book that distinguishes very clearly between what we could call the shell of Christianity and what is really Christianity, what the meat underneath that shell. It helps us to see the difference between the shadow, if you will, and, and the substance, the difference between the picture or the mirror and what the reality really is. When you think about it, a man or a woman is an absolute idiot who would prefer reading a cookbook over eating a really good meal when they're hungry. I mean, I mean, you can read the book. The book can be very enlightening. I don't know how it will taste compared to the real thing. Yet many Christians concern themselves with the externals of Christian faith, and they completely miss what's underneath, the dynamic, radical, revolutionary concepts of what Christianity really is. Jesus did not say, you shall know the rules and be bound by them. He didn't say that. He said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So this author of Hebrews, who we don't know who it is, this author tells us that Christianity is not merely a set of rules. It's not something you do for your country. It's not something you do for your community for your home, for yourself, for your family. It's not even something you do for God. Christianity is what God does in you and for you. So this book of Hebrews contrasts the new arrangement, if you will, for living with the old basis of trying your best to walk the narrow path, to keep the rules. And truth be told, we lean very strongly, as men and women today, we lean very strongly about keeping rules. We're great rule keepers. Someone has likened humanity to a man who was walking along and he fell down in a well. He cried out for help, as anyone would, and someone was walking by, a passerby. He heard his cries. He leaned over the well and he asked the man, what do you want? What can I give you? What do you need? The man says, I want to get out. I want to get out of this well. And the passerby thought for a moment, took out a piece of paper, wrote on it, dropped it down to the well, and the guy at the bottom. The man picked it up. He read this with these words. Ten rules on how to stay out of wells. <laughs> it's been suggested that this is what the law the Mosaic law has been to us. It's a set of rules 
on how to stay out of wells after we've fallen into one. You know what the real problem is with mankind? Mankind does not know that he or she has fallen into a well. We don't recognize that. He thinks he was made to live in wells, that this is the natural part of life. And therefore, he can under, can't understand why he is so unhappy in the well. That's where he feels he belongs. That's all he knows. The coming of the Mosaic Law, the Ten Commandments, has made him realize this situation, but it still can't help him out. This is really what the author of Hebrews is telling us all the way through all 13 chapters of this book. He's saying that Jesus Christ is a rope. Jesus Christ's rope that's dropped into the well. And more than that, it's, he's the winch, if you will, when you're holding on to it, that's going to take you out of that well. And besides that, he's going to keep you from falling in other wells as you live your life day to day. He's complete. The tabernacle, which was built in the wilderness with its regulations and strange customs and rules and sacrifices, was a picture of the work of Jesus Christ. And it was the new arrangement for living which would be available to men and women who are in Christ. But it's only up to a point. Because it was both a comparison and a contrast. Both like it and unlike it, that's really what pictures are. The tabernacle was a picture, but, but that's really what pictures are. They're very inadequate when you think about it, because you can't have a conversation. You can't have a relationship with a photograph. The photograph may be an extremely accurate representation of the real thing. I want to tell you what, it's a far cry from reality. And this is what the book of Hebrews stresses over and over and over. In the section of Scripture we're going to be looking at today, the the writer here concludes his explanation of the new arrangement for living in Jesus Christ. And he does that by listing the advantages in contrast to the picture of what the tabernacle is. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in both the ninth and 10th chapter of this book. I'm going to start in verse 24 of chapter 9. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. The old system that the Jews had known for years and years and years and centuries, that system with all its regulations, its rituals, its rites, its sacrifices, was limited to one particular place, the tabernacle, and specifically the part of the tabernacle that's made by hands, the Holy of Holies. But the writer says that in Christ a new arrangement has come. It's a new dimension totally of life itself. This new dimension of living is really can be described as heaven here on earth. This truth is what makes it possible for the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians. He says this, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Heaven is in our heart because where is Jesus Christ? He's in our heart. 
It's the new dimension. It's the new dimension of life in the Spirit. When I die, when you die in Christ, you go to heaven. You simply now enter into this relation in a new and a more greater and more fulfilled way than you've experienced while you were in the body. So the writer of Hebrews is indicating here that Christ's work for you and for me is never ever hindered of where we are because He is within us. And He appears before the presence of God at this very minute on behalf of you and behalf of me. Then the writer points out that the old system required this endless repetition over and over and over again of sacrifice because the effects of these sacrifices never lasted very long. A man had to bring a fresh sacrifice every time he fell flat in his face, every time he sinned. And once a year, the whole nation had to offer the same sacrifice year after year after year on a date known as Yom Kippur. However, this new arrangement is beyond time. It's beyond time as well as beyond space. The cross of Jesus Christ is a contemporary sacrifice. Its effects are felt right now. It was offered at one point in history, 2,000 years ago, but the effect of that sacrifice, the blessings of that sacrifice are available at all times, whether it's forward in time or backward from that point in history. The Old Testament saints could have as much of Christ as we can have. The cross works as well in the 21st century as it did in the 1st century. It judges our pride. It judges our fallen human nature. And it does so as relentlessly now, after we've been a Christian maybe for 50 years, as it does when you first come to Christ. The cross of Christ is a contemporary event. So no penance or no remorse on our part can ever change or ever add anything to it. You can't add anything to it. It's complete. It is always affected because it is timeless. It's a great advantage to the old system that those people centuries ago were year after year, day after day, they had to offer sacrifice. They had to make it right. Even more, this new arrangement is beyond judgment. It's beyond judgment. In the old system, in the tabernacle, in the holy place, in the holy of holies, the high priest went into those holy of holies once a year, washed, clothed in a simple white robe, and all the people of Israel waited anxiously, anxiously, with a great deal of fear. They were going to one, they were wondering if the sacrifice would be acceptable to God. They didn't know. If it wasn't, if it was not acceptable, the entire nation would be wiped out. Because the high priest was facing the judgment of God for all of the people. In effect, God was saying that the judgment awaits a man when he dies. The writer tells us, people are destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. And when that priest on Yom Kippur came back out of the Holy of Holies, through that veil, that heavy curtain, people were absolutely relieved. Relieved. He was relieved as well because he would have been the first one to go. That's a picture of what is true in the reality that Christ represents. He has entered by death into the realm of our spirit, into the human heart, into the inner, inner life that you have of mankind. And therefore he is now invisible to the world. The world does not see him, but when he appears visibly again, it's not going to be to judge the world. The cross has already done that. It will be to establish a time of peace and of glory 
It's going to be unknown upon the earth. The earth has never seen it before. But for the Christian, this judgment is already passed. If you're in Christ, it is already passed. The judgment that a man must face when he dies has already been faced when you died in Christ. That's why the Apostle Paul can write, Therefore, there is now, now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Zippo, none, nil, nada. In the realm of the Spirit, we have already entered into triumph. We have already entered into glory. We have already been forgiven everything. The only thing we need now to do is acknowledge honestly what we've done wrong, where we've fallen short, where our attitudes were not in line. You confess it, and the moment you do, the promise is forgiveness is already yours. We need only to say one thing. Thank you. Thank you. You take it, and you go. And that is a wonderful release from a guilty conscience that is always seen to be hanging over our heads. In the tabernacle, you can also see a divine design, if you will. Let's go to the 10th, 10th chapter, first four verses. The writer says this, The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming not the realities themselves. For this reason it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now, there are a ton of pictures that, are, that we have here in, in these first four verses. We see a lot of pictures. The blood of bulls, the blood of goats, the blood of lambs is not the blood of Christ. And therefore, it cannot take away sin. But the overriding message here is that the essential quality of a God-approved life is that it, that, that life be willing to lay itself down. Every sacrifice was a life laid down. Think about it. A life was taken away. And by it, God is saying that, the, that it, this is the quality, if you will, of life that pleases him, one that is in surrender, one that is in submission. The Old Testament revealed the divine design of who God is and what his nature and character is. But in Christ, we see the divine desire of what he wants for you and I. Moving on, starting in verse 5. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, and these are words from Psalm 40, by the way. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You know, God never cared one iota, one iota, for all the blood that flowed on that Jewish altar. Never cared. He had no interest in them except that it taught men and women something and teaching us something as well. 
What God desired was what, not the sacrifice, it was what the sacrifices pointed to. A human body in which there dwelt a human will, which continually chose to depend upon an indwelling God to obey a written word. That's what he was pointing to. In Christ, in that human body, was a will that never once acted on its own. Jesus Christ never once acted on his own. He never took one step apart from total dependence upon the Father who indwelled him. And Jesus said this over and over and over in his word. If you go to John chapter 14, verse 10, he said this to his disciples, Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. So ceremonies, rites, rituals, sacraments, they mean nothing to God. He has no interest in any of those things. He has no interest in, in ritual. He has no interest in candles, in prayer books, in beads, anything. Chanting. He has no interest in those things. What he wants is a heart. He wants a heart that is his, a life that is his, and a body that is made available to him. That's why Paul, in Romans chapter 12, he had this to say. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. When Jesus Christ acted upon that principle, he allowed the direction of his life to come from only one source, and that is the Word of God. Every temptation he entered into, every problem that came his way, he referred back to what God had said. It is written, it is written, it is written. That program took him to a cross. That program called on him to lay down his life. By means of that sacrifice, we are now free to join him in this journey that is God's original intention for you and I from the get-go. For all of mankind. We see that in verse 10. And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Other translations use the word sanctified instead of made holy. And that word sanctified is, a lot of people don't understand what that word is. That's a very churchy word. You don't hear that often here. I'm not sure Scott knows how to pronounce it. The word sanctified is under, misunderstood. The word sanctified simply means to put to the proper intended use. To put things to the proper intended use. This verse is simply saying that when we adopt the same outlook as Jesus Christ, and when in, in, de in dependence upon him, we are ready to obey the word of God and therefore fill the will of God, then what we are doing, we're, we're fulfilling our purpose. We're being sanctified. We're being used in the way God intends and wants us to be used. And it's different from all of it, for each of us. There's one simple mark of which that is unmistakable. We become content at something. We become content to lay down our life in order that the will of God be done. We lay down our lives. Now that does not mean that you rush out to die. In fact, it very, 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 very seldom will ever mean that. Laying down a life does not mean always dying. I'm sure a lot of people take it that way, but that's not really what it means. It means giving of yourself giving up for the moment something that you want to do, that's on your agenda, that's on your time schedule, it's on your day planner. 
It means that we are become content to lose standing at times. If it's necessary, lose standing in the eyes of the world. We are no longer regard those things as important in our life. Because we're surrendered, we're in submission. It means we give up material comfort or gain if it's going to advance the cause of Jesus Christ in the world. You know, every year, and a lot of you know this, every year we host a vacation Bible school right here in this building. That vacation Bible school draws some 700 to 800 children every day. They're here for an entire week. And there are numbers of men and women who each year take a week's vacation to minister here to these kids. It's an amazing sight. They're here every day. And I'll tell you what, for those four hours you're here, you are tired than if you put in 24 hours at your regular job. But these people, they take this vacation, they look forward to it. They choose to touch the lives of these young people instead of setting up their beach chair down at, down at the beach and working on their tan. They choose to be here. And that doesn't even take into consideration all the work and preparation that goes into weeks and weeks and weeks before we ever see those kids for the first time. People here that are decorating and putting into place all the little magical things that impress someone about the love of God in the life of a child. You know, God neither wants nor desires to see great cathedrals or wonderful buildings built. He doesn't care for buildings. He doesn't care for rituals. He doesn't care for ceremonies. What God wants are lives, bodies, and hearts that are His, that are available to Him to work and to shape those people in the shops, in the offices, in the streets, in the schools, wherever human beings are, so that his life may be visible in terms of that person in that place. That is Christianity. We are all little Christ in the eyes of the world. In this closing section of Scripture, I want you to notice something. The new arrangement here is what I want you to notice in its sufficiency. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 11. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, and these are words from the prophet Jeremiah, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them in their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. You know, one of the huge, unusual aspects of the old tabernacle was that it had no chairs. There were no chairs in the tabernacle. There was never a place for a, the priest to sit down because they were expected to be continually ministering. But when Jesus Christ, when Jesus offered himself as a single, complete sacrifice, did you hear what he said? What, we, what he did? He sat down. The writer says he sat down at the right hand of God, the place of honor, to wait for his enemies to be made a footstool. There's nothing more for Jesus Christ to do. He has done all that is needed for you and for me and for this world. 
the Old Testament priest needed to revisit over and over and over and over again the whole sacrificial process that we now know can never take away sin. But with his sacrificial death, Jesus demonstrated what needed to happen if this job was to get done. And when he did it, and he did do it, it unleashed something. It unleashed a power that will prevail. A power that's never going to stop until it wins what God is after. Until all the enemies of Christ become his footstool, and it is time to return again to the reestablishment of his kingdom on earth. There's a power in this principle that is quiet, but it's also very relentless, and it is a power that is irresistible. Where men and women, when you and I, when we find anyone that are willing to lay down their lives, nothing can stand in their way. Nothing can stop it. It is bound to win because the power of God himself is behind it. When you've rested everything upon everything that Jesus Christ has done for you, you have entered into a place, a very special place, where great power is now at your disposal. It's there. You can use it. God says, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. You can know what God wants done and you, even more important, you can expect him to do it through you. There's no doubt. More than that, you enter into perfect peace of mind. No quarrel, no disagreement between you and God any longer. You are fully, completely accepted. God has promised that he will remember their sins and lawless acts no more. Or as my buddy Tim Keller would say, he has relegated your sins to eternal forgetfulness. It doesn't even occur to him. They're gone. They're gone. And as we close, finally, the writer says that when you come to this place, what more do you really need? Because where there is forgiveness for all of your sins, past, present, future, there's no more offering for sins needed. Man has drawn near to God through his son, Jesus Christ. And that relationship is absolutely complete. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, the gospel is beyond good news. The, the gospel is unbelievably graceful. Lord, as we get into your word and we start to really understand what you're saying to us, it is beyond our comprehension of what you've given us and what you provided for us and what it all means. Lord, we read that Old Testament, so many of us are turned off because we don't understand. I mean, it's so strange. Rituals and sacrifices and cleansing and rules and regulations. But Lord, it was never about those things. It was always what they pointed to, what they were mirrors of, what they were pictures of. And as we read and we study, we see how it all comes together. You gave us the law not only because it's part of your nature and your character, you also gave us the law to show us how impossible it is for us to meet the standards of holiness. And that's why your son came. That's why your son died. With his arms wide open, welcoming us into this new relationship that will last forever, that is absolutely perfect. We are sons and daughters adopted into the family with all the rights and privileges. Lord, allow us to meditate and ponder upon that unbelievable news. Because when we do, it drives us to our knees to merely say, thank you. In Christ's name we pray it. Amen. Have a great day today. Oh